Some of you know my work from my book, Occult America, and things that I've done related to that, which is a history of supernatural religious movements in our country. And uh, as those of you who know my work are aware, I feel very strongly that occult and esoteric and mystical movements touch this country very, very deeply. And I write about these movements not only as a historian who's passionately interested in how the paranormal, the occult, the supernatural has shaped our religion, our economy, our psychology, and our views of ourselves. But I write about these things also as a, a participant, as a kind of a believing historian. I don't think these things are just incidental movements that reveal aspects of human nature that we have to understand. That's true enough. But I think they hold actual ideas for human transformation. I don't believe in looking into things that we just put in museum cases and say, well, you know, that was odd. That was novel. But I think we need practical philosophies that contribute to real-life transformation in the here and now. And in my study of different occult and mystical systems, some of which I wrote about in Occult America, some of which I'm writing about in my next book, One Simple Idea, I have to tell you the most impactful, elegant, simplest, and dramatically powerful figure I have ever come across is this man, Neville Goddard. He was born to an Anglican family on the island of Barbados in 1905. It was a family of ten children, nine boys and one girl. He came here to New York City to study theater in 1922. He had some success. And he fell into a variety of mystical and occult philosophies and he felt he had discovered the master key to existence. And up to this point in my experiments, he may have been right. You can determine that for yourselves. Because I'm going to start off by giving you his system. And then I'm going to talk about a little history, where he came from, who his teachers were, what his ideas grew out of, who he's influenced, and why he was vastly ahead of his time, and why some of the things that Neville experimented with are being heard about today in some intelligent and informed and unsensationalized discussions of developments in quantum physics and neurobiology. And we can also talk about the possible identity of the hidden spiritual master named Abdullah, who he said was his teacher here in New York City. Are there spiritual masters, masters of wisdom in the world, people who provide help to us when we sincerely desire it? Is that a real possibility or is that just fantasy? I think it's a possibility. It may have played out in his existence. But we're really here to talk about the practical side of his philosophy because there's a lot of interesting folks, you know, I could give you talks about. Colorful, dramatic figures whose lives span the globe but we're talking about Neville because of his ideas, and I want to start with them. Neville believed, very simply, in the principle that your imagination is God. The human imagination is God. And that scripture and all the stories from Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, have absolutely no basis in historical reality. The entire book is a metaphor, a blueprint for the individual's personal development. And in particular, the New Testament tells the story of God, metaphorically, of God descending into human form, humanity becoming asleep to its own divine essence, its Christ essence, believing itself to live in a coarse, limited world, 
of material parameters being crucified in the agony of this forgetfulness when Christ yells out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then being resurrected into the realization of the divine potentiality within every individual. Neville maintained, both through his reading of Scripture, his own personal probings as a philosopher, and his own experiments as an individual, that there is no God, and that those who wrote Scripture never intended to communicate that there was a God outside of the individual's own imagination. That creative force that exists within us, that thinks, that plans, that ponders, that falls in and out of emotive states. Very nice. Welcome. Welcome. You haven't missed much. <laughs> We're just getting to the good part. And Neville maintained that your thoughts, your mental pictures, and your emotive states create your concrete reality and are doing so at every moment of existence, but we are asleep to it. We live in these coarse shells. We suffer, we cry, we have fleeting joys. We leave these forms. We go through life in this state of slumber without ever knowing that each one of us is a physical form in which creation is experiencing itself. And that coming to that realization can bring you into the powers written about in metaphor in the New Testament that are embodying the story of Christ resurrected. I want to say to you that he meant this in the most radical and literal sense. There was nothing inexact or qualified about what he said. He took an unbelievably radical stand and he continually put out a challenge to his audiences, which was try it. Try it tonight. And if it doesn't work, discard me, discard my philosophy, prove me a liar. He sold nothing. These are facts. He published a handful of books, all of which are now in public domain. He gave lectures, Grateful Dead style, where he allowed everybody to take them and distribute them freely, which is why his stuff is right all over the internet. There's nothing to join. There's nothing to buy. There's no copyright holder. There's just this man and his ideas. They came down to this three-part formula. Incredibly simple, but requiring a commitment. One, every creative act begins with an absolute passionate desire. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? We walk around all day long with desires. I want this, I want that, I want money, I want relationships, I want this person to pay attention to me, I want this attainment. His approach, and I think something that was very valuable in the positive thinking movement that got overlooked, and I read about this a lot in the new book, is we all have these superficial understandings of our desires, and we're dishonest about our desires. Peter, can you make room? Thank you. Um, we're dishonest about our desires, because we don't want to say to ourselves, in our innermost thoughts, what we really want. What we really want. Sometimes we're repulsed by our desires. And that's the truth. You know, we live in a society that's filled with so much, you know, personal license and freedom on the surface, of course. But we don't like to acknowledge things to ourselves that maybe are unattractive. I want to tell a personal story. And I want to be very personal with you tonight because I'm talking to you about a man and a philosophy that is enormously challenging and practical if you really take it seriously. And I have no right to be standing here talking to you unless I tell you about what some of my own experiences with it have been. And I will talk about some of my own experiences. But I want to talk about this first point, desire. Years ago, I knew a woman who was a psychic, a nationally known person, 
some of you in this room would, would have heard of her, not a household name by any means, but well-known person. I thought she had a genuine psychical gift. I thought she had something. I didn't like the way she led her life because I felt personally that she could be a kind of violent person, not physically violent, but emotionally so. She would manipulate people around her, bully people, push people around. I didn't particularly like her, but I did feel that she had a true gift. <laughs> and one night, I was talking to her. We were in a parking lot somewhere. And we were having a conversation, and she stopped, and she said to me, you know what you want? You want power. But your problem is, you have an overdeveloped superego. And as soon as I heard this, you know, I immediately wanted to push it away. And I spent years pushing it away. Years pushing it away. Because I thought to myself, well, you know, I don't want power like you, lady. You know, I don't want power to push people around, to bully people, to be violent towards people. I don't want that. You know, and I so recoiled at what she said. But it haunted me. It haunted me. I could never get away from it. We don't know really what haunts us until we confront something in ourselves or maybe something that a sensitive person says to us that makes us terribly uncomfortable but might just be the truth. So when Neville talks about desire, He's not talking about something superficial that we keep telling ourselves day after day. He really wants you to get down into the guts of it. Or you might want something that makes you very, very, very uncomfortable. You know, there are ways we don't like to see ourselves. But he maintains that desire is God speaking to us. This inner God that exists within us. And to walk away from it is to walk away from the potential greatness within ourselves. Desire is the language of God, he says. And he means it in the most literal sense. Two, physical immobility. This is the part where you actually do something. You go into a physically immobile state. You choose a time of day where you like to meditate, whether it's early morning, whether it's late at night. The time of day he chose was 3 p.m., We'd eat lunch, and we'd get tired after lunch. We'd go into sort of a drowsy state. Now, this is very important, because we think of meditation, typically, as a state of kind of an exquisite awareness. We don't think of meditation as drowsiness. Now, there's different ways that people use these terms. But Neville believed, and as I will talk about later in this presentation, I think he was onto something. When we are in what is sometimes called... Uh, a hypnagogic state, a hypnagogic state, that state just between wakefulness and sleep. You're in it just at night when you're drifting off. You're in it just in the morning when you're coming to. Our minds are exquisitely sensitive at that time. You know, people who suffer from depression or from grief, oh, they often describe the early morning hours as the most difficult time of day. And the reason for that, I'm convinced, is that it is a time when our rational defenses are down. We're all emotion. We're all emotion. We're conscious. But we are in this very, very subtle, fine state between sleep and wakefulness. And our rational defenses are down. And let me tell you, <coughs> and I can test this through personal experience, <laughs> if you are trying to solve a personal problem, do not do it at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Don't. Get up and watch Laverne and Shirley. Do whatever you have to do. Your rational defenses are down. And when you need your mind, when you need your intellect, whether you're solving a financial problem, whether you're going through a relationship problem, whether you've suffered a loss, whatever it is, when you need your intellect to say, look, how am I going to organize things here? How am I going to work out the next step? Do not do it at 5 o'clock in the morning. Your mind ain't working. Your emotions are working. It is a tough, tough time to deal with problems. But it can be a very unique time to deal with desires. Because your rational defenses are down. And your mind can go in remarkable directions. And I'm going to talk about later about some developments in psychical research where there have been some extraordinary findings under real clinical conditions, under rigorous clinical conditions, 
in which people were induced into this hypnagogic state, this state between sleep and wakefulness, and the mind could go in remarkable directions. Remarkable directions. So, Neville said, go into a state of physical immobility. You can do it just before you go to sleep at night. He didn't say you can do it when you wake in the morning, but I think you can extrapolate from that. You can do it when you're meditating. You can do it whenever you want. It takes only a few minutes. But go into a very relaxed bodily state, or just let yourself be taken into it when you go to bed at night. You can do it when you go to bed at night. Go into a very relaxed physical state. And then, three, form a very clear, simple, mental picture of your desire fulfilled. Something that will communicate your desire fulfilled. Simple. There was a woman in one of his lectures, she deeply wanted to be married. That's what she wanted. And he said to her, enact the feeling of a ring on your finger. That's all. Just that. Just that. Enact the feeling of a ring on your finger. Something simple. Maybe there's something you want from an individual. Enact that scene. Simple. Just a handshake. Just a handshake. Something that might communicate that you've received. He was adamant about this. Don't see yourself doing it as if you're watching it on a screen. He would say, if I want to imagine myself climbing a ladder, I don't see myself climbing a ladder. I climb. You must see yourself actually performing the action. A handshake, a ring, whatever it is, find one simple, clear, persuasive, physical action that would communicate the attainment of your goal and think from that end. Think from the end of the goal fulfilled. And he would always say to people, when you open your eyes, you'll be back here in the coarse world that you might not want to be in. But if you persist in this, your assumption will harden into fact. You must think from the state of fulfillment. Wake up. Come out of your physical immobility. Yes, the world will be exactly as it is. If you want to be in Paris and you open your eyes and in New York, you may be disappointed that you're still in New York. Keep doing it, and extraordinary events will unfold to secure precisely what you have pictured in your mind. Now, one thing that Neville said, but that I want to emphasize, and I, I think perhaps he could have gone even further to emphasize this in his method, he does say it is important that the visual state is also accompanied by an emotive state. We make the mistake, and a mistake that has run through the positive thinking movement is equating intellect with emotions. They are two different things. I have a physical existence, I have an intellectual existence, I have an emotional existence. Part of the reason we feel so torn apart is because these things are all going on in their own way. I'm not going to eat. Well, but the body wants to eat. I'm going to be cool, but the emotions are furious. I'm going to think, I'm going to use my intellect, but the emotions are off doing something else. When you enact this state, this picture, this mental picture of fulfillment, you have to try to also experience the emotions that you would feel in your state of fulfillment. This is a good philosophy, this is a good method for people who are actors. You know, read Stanislavski's book, An Actor Prepares. Anybody who's been trained in method acting often learns to use a kind of inner monologue to get themselves into an emotional state. That's a good exercise. You have to get the emotions there. So, let's say you want a promotion at work, just to pull something out of the air. You could picture your boss or whomever shaking your hand and hear him or her say, congratulations, congratulations. You have to try to feel those emotions that you would feel in that state. That's his formula. An intense desire, and a sincere one, physical immobility into this drowsy, hypnagogic state, and the assumption of the wish already fulfilled. If there is evidence for a thing, does it matter what the world thinks, no, said. I want to tell a personal story. I'm going to start to go through the history more quickly after this, but I feel like you have no reason to trust what I'm saying unless I've tested it myself. And now we always urge his audiences, test it, test it, 
He spoke with this beautiful clipped British accent. What do you most desire right now? Go home this night and test it. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. It was always his challenge. Does any of this work? I'll tell you a story. I have a lot of stories I can tell you. I'll limit it to one that's very recent and very explicit and absolutely real. I'm, uh, in addition to being a writer, I'm a publisher. I'm the editor-in-chief of a division at Penguin that publishes New Age and metaphysical books. I acquired the rights after about a year of searching down the estate and the rights holder to a book called Wake Up and Live by a writer named Dorothea Brand, who is a pioneering journalist and self-help writer. And Brand published this book, Wake Up and Live, in 1936. She maintained in this book that the pathology of human nature is that we all have what she called a will to fail. We fear failure and humiliation more than we crave success. So we constantly mess up our plans. We procrastinate, we make excuses for ourselves, we blow important projects or relationships because we're more frightened of being humiliated if we fail than we are hungry for success. So Brand believed that if you could actually act as if it were impossible to fail, you could bypass what she called this will to fail. She was a genius, and I love her, and I love everything she did. So I spent a year trying to find her descendants so I could buy rights to this book. I finally do. Um, it took a long time. So there's an audio publisher who wants to put out an audio edition of this book. Audio narration is something that I do, and this was a uh, Several weeks ago, this must have been about maybe two and a half months ago at this point. I very much like doing audio narration. I want to do more of it. And I made it known to this publisher I was just dying to narrate this audio book. I had recorded this publisher before, it had been successful, and I thought, well, naturally they'll say yes. They wouldn't get back to me. My emails were ignored, my phone calls were ignored. I was very frustrated. I couldn't understand why they didn't want me to do this book. Um, I'm obviously brimming with passion for it. I've done good work for them before, but I just couldn't get anywhere. I was totally stuck. And I was very frustrated. I was very frustrated. Because I thought to myself, well, you know, not only do I want to be doing more audio books, but this is the kind of book that I was born to read, you know. Born to read. But I couldn't get anywhere. I was stuck. I was very frustrated. So, I went into this exercise, and I formed a mental picture. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's too personal. But it's very simple. I can tell you that. Very simple. So I go into this mental exercise. Oh, and by the way, as a side note, the audio publisher did get back to me. They said no. <laughs> Thanks for getting back to me. <laughs> no. Okay. That was it. I was told no. I go into this exercise, I formed a mental picture, I did it faithfully, and I did it probably two or three times a day, I don't know, for about two weeks. Out of the clear blue, without any intervention whatsoever on my part, a rights manager calls me up and says to me, guess what? Someone else actually just bought the rights to that book. It's not with that publisher anymore. There's been a change. There's a new audio publisher. And I said, would you tell that new audio publisher that I am dying to read this book? So she says, okay, I'll tell them. She gets back to me. The new publisher says, I sent Horowitz an email a week ago asking him to read another book, and he never got back to me. Why? <laughs> God's honest truth. So I go into my spam folder, it ain't there. I go into my super duper spam folder, there it is. There was something earlier, unrelated, that I had forgotten about that I asked to read for this guy. He wanted me to read it. Not only did he want me to read it, but he wanted me to do a total of three books for him. 
I'm now signed up to do two more, including that one that I was signed to do. I went from being told no, I went from being ignored to being told no, to dropping it. I did nothing to influence any of this in the outer world. I'm a lousy Monday morning quarterback anyway, and I didn't do anything or make any call to anybody about anything. I just did that. I went from a no to seeing the rights moved to another publisher to seeing the other publisher say, I contacted him a week ago, why the hell didn't he get back to me? I'm now going on to my fifth book of narration for that publisher, and I recorded Wake Up and Live. There's reasons that it could be argued that this was completely ordinary, and I'm not oblivious to them, obviously. But I can tell you this, from where I stood, it didn't feel ordinary. I know the reasons. It didn't feel ordinary. Take my challenge and put my words to the test. If the law does not work, its knowledge will not comfort you. And if it is not true, you must discard it. I hope you will be bold enough to test me. That's what Neville said over and over and over. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to buy anything. If you've got a computer, you can go online, listen to his lectures. We'll play a little clip of one later. His books can all be downloaded for free. His lectures can all be downloaded for free. And all he would say is, Put me to the test. Put me to the test. Neville was born in 1905 on the island of Barbados, as I mentioned. He was not born to a wealthy, land-holding family. He was born to an Anglican family of merchants. Uh, they ran a catering business, basically. And one of the things that I found about Neville, and I read about this in the new book, is that stuff that he claimed in his lectures often turned out to be true. And I did a lot to track down some of Neville's claims. Now, he came to New York City to study theater and to study dancing in 1922. And he didn't have any money. He was uh, a poor kid who knocked about. He lived uh, in a shared apartment on the Upper West Side on West 75th Street. Um, his family was a large family. He was one of ten kids. They were not rich. But over the course of time, they became very rich. And they put him on a kind of an allowance or a monthly stipend. <coughs> Wouldn't you like that? To have your rich family put you on a monthly stipend? Um, so he was able to pursue his studies into the occult, into philosophy, into mysticism completely independently. Well, Goddard Industries, you can go visit their website. They're a big catering business in Barbados. They not only cater for parties and events, but they cater for airlines. So all that delicious food that is no longer served on airlines is made by them. Um, they cater for cruise ships and things like that. They're, they're uh, by the standards of the West Indies, they're, they're a very large and thriving business. Everything that was said in his lectures is true. This was his father, Joe, or Joseph, who founded the business. This is his brother, Victor, who he talks about a lot in his lectures. I'm not going to go into all the details here. Um, because I sort of have a more exciting example that I want to bring to you, but everything that Neville described about the rise of his family's fortune, absolute matches uh, business records and reportage in uh, West Indian newspapers. Neville lived in Greenwich Village for many years. Uh, this was uh, the apartment building that he lived in at uh, 32 Washington Square on the um, <clears throat> west side of the park. Um, this building is now owned by NYU, as all of us are. And uh, he, spent, he spent many years happily there. Now here was a story that interested me in his lectures, and I determined to track down the truth of it, and I did. Um, Neville was uh, drafted into the Army on uh, November 12, 1942. Um, just a little less than a, a year into uh, America's entry into World War II. So it was really at the height of the war. Everybody was being drafted. He was a little old to be drafted. He was 37 at that time, but still could be drafted at that age. And so he tells these stories in his lectures. You can find these lectures online. They're super easy to find. He didn't want to be in the Army. He wanted no part of the war. 
he wanted to return back home to Greenwich Village. At that time, he was married. He had a small daughter. He had a son from an earlier marriage. He wanted to go back lecturing. He wanted no part of the army. He's uh, in basic training at a fort in Louisiana. And he said, so every night, every night he would lay down on his bed and imagine himself back in Greenwich Village, walking around Washington Square Park, back with his wife and family. Every night he would go to bed. So he asked his commanding officer for a discharge, and the commanding officer shockingly said, no. Night after night after night, he did this. And he said, finally, out of the clear blue sky, the commanding officer comes to him. He says, yes, you still want to be discharged? No. He says, yes, I do. You're being honorably discharged. And I'm reading this in his lectures, and I'm thinking, well, this is probably a bunch of crap. You know, why would the United States want to be discharged a perfectly healthy, athletic male at the, at the height of America's entry into the Second World War? It just makes no sense. So I started looking for Neville's, Neville's military records and seeing if there were other things that would, that would back this up. Neville claimed that he entered the military in late 1942 and that he was honorably discharged about four months later using nothing other than these mental emotive techniques. That was his claim. So, I found Neville's surviving military records. He was, in fact, inducted into the Army November 12, 1942. I spoke to an Army public affairs officer who confirmed that Neville was discharged, honorably discharged, in March 1943, that was the date of his last U.S. Army pay stub, and the reason for the discharge, as it's listed on official military records, is he had to return to a vital civilian occupation. And I said to the guy, well, this was a metaphysical lecturer. How is that a vital <laughs> civilian occupation? And he said to me, well, unfortunately, the rest of Mr. Goddard's records were destroyed in a fire in 1973 one year following Neville's death. Is there no more? There is a profile of Neville in the New Yorker, surprisingly enough, the New Yorker ran a, a very extensive profile of him in September of 1943 that shows him back on the lecture circuit. He's speaking all around town. He's in Midtown at the Actors Church. He's down in Greenwich Village. And he completely resumed his career, this vital civilian occupation, as a metaphysical lecturer after serving four months in the military. Now, I can't tell you what happened. I can only tell you that the forensics, as he described it, were accurate. I found that in several instances with Neville. He describes an unlikely story, claims that he used his method, as I've described it to you. I can't tell you what happened, but I can tell you that the forensics match up. This is Neville's application um, for naturalization and citizenship, filled out in September 1st of 1943. You see his address is listed as 32 Washington Square. At the time, he's 38 years old. You can see his signature at the bottom of the screen. Everything he described in terms of his whereabouts added up. Now, I want to say a quick word about where this philosophy came from. Where did Neville get these ideas? He is part of a movement that I call the positive thinking movement. And where did some of this come from? Uh, it was a very American philosophy, and it was very much a homegrown American philosophy, but every thought that's ever been thought has been encountered by sensitive people by searching in their own Hermes, and was the progenitor of all ideas, all intellect. One of the ideas that you found within Hermetic philosophy, which was a Greek Egyptian philosophy that was written about and set down in the Greek language in the city of Alexandria a few decades following the death of Christ, was this idea that through proper preparation, diet, meditation, prayer, the human individual could be permeated by divine forces. 
That was a key tenet of Hermetic philosophy, of this Greek-Egyptian philosophy. This was reborn during the Renaissance, where the figure of Hermes Trismegistus was depicted in woodcuts. He was considered a great figure of, of antiquity, of an antiquity as old as Moses or older still. The Hermetic literature was later dated correctly to late antiquity. And its ideas, uh, to a great extent, went out of vogue as the Renaissance faded. Uh, because the founders of the Renaissance had placed such great hopes that the writings attributed to this figure, Hermes Trismegistus, had great antiquity, and when those hopes of antiquity were rearranged, were dashed, and these writings were actually dated accurately to late antiquity, the readjustment of the timeline, I think, tragically for Western civilization, convinced people that the whole project of the Hermetic literature was somehow compromised. So, to this day, to this day, there are actually very few good translations of this Hermetic literature, which was written in Greek, occasionally in Latin, but more often in Greek. So, these ideas faded. The notion that, that the human form could be permeated by something higher and could itself attain a kind of creative and clairvoyant power. These ideas that were so arousing of hope in the Renaissance faded. They re-entered the public mind in a sort of peculiar way through the influence of this man, Franz Anton Mesmer, who was a lawyer and a self-styled physician of Viennese descent. He showed up in Paris in 1778, in the decade preceding the French Revolution, and he gained entry to royal courts with this radical theory that all of life was animated by this invisible etheric fluid, which he called animal magnetism. And Mesmer maintained that if you could put an individual into a kind of trance state, what we would call a hypnotic trance, again, remember Neville talking about this state of drowsiness, this hypnagogic state, that if you could put an individual into a kind of trance state, you could rearrange his or her animal magnetism, this ethereal fluid, and cure diseases, or introduce powers such as clairvoyance or the ability to speak in foreign tongues, that you could manipulate animal magnetism. You could heal, you could empower, you could somehow get at the life stuff of the individual. Now, <laughs> This was something I noticed recently in Walgreens. I love how occult language enters daily life. This was in the skin lotion aisle of Walgreens. It's mysterious and mesmerizing. Yeah. So, Mesmer left a mark on modern life in ways he didn't entirely intend. Um, his philosophy uh, became discredited in France in 1784 when King Louis XVI convened a, a royal commission which was chaired by our, our own Benjamin Franklin who at the time was ambassador to France to investigate Mesmer's theories. And I go through this in the new book. The Royal Commission concluded that um, there was no such thing as animal magnetism and whatever cures or effects were experienced under the influence of a mesmeric trance were all in the imagination. But they left dangling the most extraordinary question. Why should there be any effects from the imagination at all? Mesmer's greatest students, even while he was still alive, edged away from the idea of animal magnetism as some physical, ethereal fluid, and they struggled to come up with the first descriptions of what we would later call a subliminal mind, a subconscious mind, an unconscious mind. They didn't possess a psychological vocabulary, but they knew that something in this theory of animal magnetism was effective. They just didn't know why, and his great students were struggling to take his theories and to morph them into a, a, a kind of early, rough theory of the subconscious mind. To some extent, that was accomplished by an American, uh, a New England clockmaker named Phineas Quimby. Uh, Quimby, starting in the late 1830s, began to experiment with how states of personal excitement could make you feel better physically. He suffered from tuberculosis, and he discovered that when he would take these vigorous carriage rides in the main countryside, the effects of the tuberculosis would lift. And so Quimby began to ask himself questions about the state of his mood and the state of 
his physical well-being. And he became known as a mental healer starting in the mid-1840s. This is a very old picture. This is an old daguerreotype. Quimby, who's seated right here, would work with this young man whose name was Lucius Burkmar. Quimby would place Lucius. You see how they're sitting knee to knee and their hands are joined? This picture is probably from 1847. Quimby would work with Lucius Burkmar. Lucius, who was 19 years old, would go into a kind of hypnagogic trance, and Lucius was said to be able to clairvoyantly peer into people's bodily organs and diagnose and prescribe cures for diseases. And Quimby discovered that sometimes the cures that, that Lucius would prescribe, which were very often botanical remedies or herbal teas, had previously been prescribed by physicians and they didn't work. But when Lucius prescribed them, they did work. The difference was in the confidence of the patient, Quimby concluded. He came to feel that it didn't matter what you were administering sometimes, this remedy, that remedy, and American medicine, I mean, I can't even go into this now, but American medicine was in a horrendous state. People had good reason to be driven to mental healers and prayer healers because, if anything, they were less dangerous than most of what was then standard allopathic medicine, which involved measures that you wouldn't believe. I mean, they were medieval. They were still doing bloodletting and mercury ingestion and the administering of poisons and narcotics. Uh, at the very least, the mental healing movement didn't cause harm. And according to people's letters and records and diaries, sometimes it did a lot of good. Um, someone who briefly served as a student to Quimby was this woman, Mary Baker Eddy, who founded her own movement called Christian Science. Eddy believed that the healing ministry of Christ was an ever-present fact that was still going on on earth, and that individuals could be healed by the realization that there's only one true reality, and that is this great divine mind that has created the universe that animates everything around us, and that matter, these forms that we live in, and the floorboards underneath our feet are not real. They are illusory, as is illness, prejudice, violence, all human corruption. And any felt that if through prayer and proper understanding of Scripture, the individual could share in that idea, they could be healed. She was a remarkable figure. Sometimes uh, people will say in a far too hasty way, well, she took all her ideas from Quimby. It is not that simple. Her interlude with Quimby in the early part of the 1860s, Quimby died in 1866, was vitally important in her development, but her ideas were uniquely her own. She was an extraordinary figure. I don't think we've taken full measure in this culture of how influential Mary Baker Eddy's ideas have been. Another figure who was indirectly influential in this movement was this man, Emanuel Swedenborg, who was a Swedish scientist and mystic who worked primarily in the 1700s. Swedenborg's central idea was that the mind could be a conduit, a capillary of cosmic laws, and that everything that went on in the world, including our own thoughts, mirrored something that went on in an invisible world, a spiritual world, that we didn't see, but that we interacted with, and that everything that men and women did on earth was a mirror of something that was going on in an unseen world. And that our minds were almost like receiving stations, spiritual telegraphs for messages and ideas that were going on on a cosmic plane that we couldn't participate in in these physical forms. Swedenborg was an influence on this man, Warren Felt Evans, who was also a, a contemporary of Quimby's, briefly worked with Quimby. Evans wrote a book in 1869 uh, called The Mental Cure, which was actually probably the first book to use the term New Age in the spiritual sense that it's used today. And Evans believed, again, through prayer, the proper direction of thought, the use of affirmations, the assumption of a confident mental state, that the individual could be cured. The Mental Cure is not read anywhere today. It is a surprisingly sprightly book. You'd really be surprised. When I first had to read The Mental Cure, I thought, oh, God help me. But its pages turned quite effortlessly. Uh -huh. Evans was a brilliant writer. All of his books are, are obscure today. They're not widely read. Um, but he was an absolute seminal figure in the creation of a positive thinking movement. More indirectly, uh, the British poet William Blake also had a certain influence. It wasn't felt until long after his lifetime, but it was felt very directly on Neville. Blake believed, again, 
that we humans live in this coarse world where we're imprisoned in this fortress of illusions. But the one true mind, the great creative imagination of God, can course through us. If we can cleanse the doors of perception, we can feel the coursing of this great mind through us. These are ideas that echoed Hermeticism. There wasn't a connection necessarily. People weren't all sitting around. First of all, there weren't that many translations of some of the, the Hermetic literature that a man like William Blake could even draw upon. People from different epochs and eras came to these ideas themselves. You know, sometimes it's not common that academic writers will approach new thought or the positive thinking movement. When they do, they sometimes make the mistake of conflating it uh, with the idealist philosophy of figures like uh, Barclay and Kant and Hegel and later Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. The positive thinking figures were not influenced by the idealists. Those figures are absent in their writings. They are absent. People also make the mistake of not realizing that in a country like America, which was a very agricultural country throughout most of the 19th century, not all this stuff was readily available. Um, you know, the Tao Te Ching, the great ancient Chinese work of ethics and philosophy, wasn't even translated into English until 1838. In the mid-1840s, there were four copies in all of the United States. One was in the library at Harvard, one was in Ralph Waldo Emerson's library, which he lent out, and two were in private hands. So it wasn't like somebody like Phineas Quimby, the New England clockmaker who was experimenting with moods and the body, could just sit down and read Hermetic philosophy, or read a translation of Hegel, or read the Tao Te Ching. These things weren't accessible. It's a mistake, because one system of thought mirrors another, to think that one is the birth mother of another. People were independently coming up with these ideas. Now, a figure who was a 20th century figure who influenced Neville was this man, Emile Coué. He was a self-trained French hypnotherapist. He died in 1926, but shortly before he died, he made a couple of tours in the United States. He was hugely popular in the U.S. and in England. He had this key theory, and again, he drew upon this idea that when you're entering this sleepy, drowsy state, this hypnagogic state, the mind is uniquely subtle and powerful. And he came up with a system that was so simple that everybody made fun of him for it. You've probably heard of it. He told people to repeat to themselves the mantra, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. And he said you should lay in bed, just as you're coming to in the morning, repeat that 20 times to yourself. You could knot a piece of string, keep that piece of string with you at your bedside so you could count it off like a rosary. 20 times at night, he said, try it, try it. The effects can be extraordinary. He had thousands of followers. But he also became a figure of ridicule because, of course, the great intellects said to themselves, how could such a simple idea possibly do anything for anyone? Of course I haven't tried it. It's nonsense. Everyone knows that. Reminds me of like Dr. Zayas in Planet of the Apes. Cornelius, man can't fly. It's a physical impossibility. You know, there's this absence of experience. And that's the impoverishment of our intellectual culture. It's certainty in the absence of experience. Not opinion. Not predilection. Not prejudice, certainty in the absence of experience. So there's no desire to actually try the thing being suggested. One of Kuei's ideas that was figured into Neville's thought system, and, 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 and you can find language of it from time to time in Neville's lectures, is that within human beings there exist two forces, the imagination and the will. The will is our self-determination. The imagination is the mental pictures that we're filled with, particularly with regard to our self-image, our idea about ourselves, the emotions that we hold about ourselves. Kuwe said that when imagination and will are in conflict, imagination will always win. Our emotional state will always overcome our intellect. As an example, he said if you place a wooden plank on the floor and ask an average person to walk across it, they'll have no problem. If you raise that same wooden plank 20 feet off the ground, in many cases they'll be petrified even though there's no difference. They are capable of walking. The risk that they're going to fall is minimal. The change in conditions, though, creates an emotional state that makes them more accurate, accident-prone and nervous. And so, Kuei believed that we had to cultivate new imaginative images of ourselves and that we could not do so through the intellect. We had to do so by making use of this very subtle hypnotic state. 
He called it auto-suggestion. It was self-hypnosis, essentially. So, I find some hint of Kue in Neville. This is a picture of Neville, um, probably at the height of his career in Los Angeles in 1955. There weren't many pictures of him. I got this from a physical copy of the Los Angeles Times. This is a picture of him a little bit older, probably towards the end of the decade. Uh, he died young. He died in 1972 at age 67. This is him closer to the end of his life. And this is a very rare picture. I'm sorry it's not clearer, but this was now probably uh, just about the year of his death. I mean, he was still a robust man, but he had a weak heart, and he died of heart failure in West Hollywood, where he was living with his family at age 67 in 1972. And till the end, his voice and his powers of communication never left him. They absolutely resonated. It's interesting sometimes uh, to look at the lives of some of these figures that are, are kind of hard to pin down, uh, but they led domestic lives. You know, this was a little piece that was in the Los Angeles Times on October 21st, 1962. Miss Goddard, named as college president. Miss Victoria Goddard, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Neville Goddard, has been appointed co-chairman of, publici of campus publicity by the student government president at Russell Sage College, Troy, New York. She is an English major. Now, Victoria Goddard, or Vicky as she's known, is still living. She lives in Los Angeles in the same house that she had been living with her parents in at the time of Neville's death in 1972. Uh, she avoids all uh, publicity and contact with uh, people who are interested in Neville's ideas. I've, I've tried to reach out to her, but she has no interest in being in touch. She did give her approval indirectly to an anthology of Neville's writings that I wrote an introduction to, but uh, she doesn't want contact with his followers. Uh, she wants to lead uh, her own existence. Um, but it's funny sometimes to come across little things like this and realize that every one of us uh, share the same workaday concerns. For all of Neville's wonderful mystical theories, uh, I just have to share this one, uh, this little discourse that he went into about Liquid Plumber in a lecture that he delivered in 1970. And I just found this such a delightful reminder of how the ordinary... Uh, steps in to all of our lives, even when we're trying to deal with the most cosmic and mystical issues. He told an audience in 1970, So, you buy something because of highly publicized TV promotions. Someone highly publicized what is called liquid plumber. And so I had some moment in my bathroom where the sink was all stopped up. So I got the liquid plumber, poured it in, in abundance. It said it's, <laughs> it said it's heavier than water. And it would go all the way down and just eat up everything that is organic and will not hurt anything that is not organic. So I poured it in. Water still remained. It didn't go down. Called the plumber the next day. He couldn't come that day, but he would come the next day. So it was 48 hours. So when he came, the entire sink was eaten away by the liquid plumber. So I asked him, does this thing work? He said, it does, for two people. The one who manufactures it and the one who sells it. They are the only ones who profit by the liquid plumber. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you turned on the TV, and you saw it, and you bought it. It is still on TV. And I am sinning. Because to sin by silence when I should protest makes cowards of us all. But I haven't protested to the station that advertises this nonsense, and I haven't protested to the place where I got it, or to anyone who manufactures it. So I am the silent sinner. Multiply me because of my embarrassment. Here is a sink completely eaten up by liquid plumber. <laughs> and so that is the world in which we live. And so the same thing goes for selling any other product. So, <laughs> the silent sinner he saw himself as. Yeah. I, I lodge letters of protest and phone calls quite frequently, as my wife can tell you. So I sympathize with everything Neville was saying there. Um, Neville published uh, a variety of books during his lifetime, most of them quite short. There was a company in Los Angeles called G&J &G Publishing that published, issued most of his books. This was the symbol that he always used, um, which he devised himself, uh, a heart with, a, with an eye to, to symbolize eternal vision, inner vision, and fruit growing from the tree to which the heart uh, surmounts or is attached. So as the emotive state, as the mental state of man conceives, so the tree brings forth fruit. This was a little pamphlet he published, He Breaks the Shell. You see this little cherub or angelic figure coming out of this egg. Neville described a mystical experience, and he said this is an experience that all of us will have. All of us will have, either in this lifetime or another. That 
the whole purpose of human existence is to be reborn and your imagination as we experience it physically lodged in our skull is entombed in this kind of a womb Christ was crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull. He believed that we each have to be reborn from within our own skull. And that we will have an actual physical experience, maybe in the form of a dream, but a vivid, tactile experience of being reborn from out of the base of our skull. And we will know in that moment that we are fulfilling our central purpose. And he described this quite vividly. He had this experience in New York City in 1959 where he had this enormously tactile, sensationally real dream of being reborn from out of his skull. Minerva was said to have been reborn from the skull of Zeus or Jupiter. Christ was crucified at the place of the skull. You and I, so he says, will be reborn from within our skull. And a booking agent said to him, listen, you know, you've got to stop telling the story in your talks. It's freaking everyone out. You've got to go back to the get rich stuff. And he said, now, I'll, I'll tell it to the bare walls. I'll tell it to the bare walls. And he, meant, he spoke of it for the rest of his career until he died in 1972. Um, I reissued one of Neville's books recently, The Power of Awareness. I felt for the first time Neville's books needed to be packaged in a way that fit their dignity. And this is a beautiful edition that I took great joy in working in because I thought it packaged him with the right degree of dignity. I want you to hear Neville's voice. Uh, he spoke with such beautiful, resonant language, so unhalting, never a pause, never an uncertainty. He knew his outlook so well, he could share it effortlessly. Hear this voice. So I'm telling you of the power within you. And that power is your own wonderful human imagination. And that is the only God in the world. There is no other God. That is the Jesus Christ of Scripture. So tonight, take it seriously. If you really have an objective in this world, and you're waiting for something to happen on the outside, to make it so, forget it. Do it in your own wonderful human imagination. Actually bring it into being in your own imagination. Conjure a scene which would imply the fulfillment of that dream. And lose yourself in the act as you contemplate it. And completely lose yourself in that state. If you're completely absorbed in it, you would objectify it and you would see it seemingly independent of your perception of it. But even if you do not have that intensity, if you lose yourself in it and feel it to be true, the imaginal act, then drop it. In a way you do not know, it will become true. If you are interested in hearing more of Neville, uh, you can go online and find lectures of his that are posted on YouTube almost everywhere. He allowed people to come to his presentations, to freely take them, to distribute them. He claimed copyright and ownership over nothing. And to me, that's the mark of a real leader. That's the mark of a real thinker. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to ask anybody permission for anything. You don't have to pay any dues. You don't have to buy anything. You just start. Um, some of the people who have been influenced by Neville today, I want to say a quick word about. One of them is uh, the baseball pitcher, Barry Zito, who was actually the guy who introduced me to Neville. I was doing an article about him in 2003, and he said to me, oh, you must be into Neville. And I said, I've never heard of him. He said, really? you never heard of him? And he was the first one who got me interested in Neville's thought. And um, that was a huge influence in my life. It was almost 10 years ago to this very day. It was almost 10 years ago. And it, it in many regards, put me where I am today. Uh, the New Age writer Wayne Dyer wrote a lot about Neville in his most recent book, which is called Wishes Fulfilled. But a really remarkable uh, influence that Neville brought into the world was um, a subtle one on the writer uh, Carlos Castaneda, who I'm a great, great admirer of. Um, I want to read a little passage from a forthcoming book. It's very short. Um, 
By the mid-1950s, Neville's life story exerted a powerful pull on a budding writer whose own memoirs of mystic discovery later made him a near-household name, Carlos Castaneda. Castaneda told his own tales of tutelage under a mysterious instructor, in this case a Native American sorcerer named Don Juan. Castaneda first discovered Neville through an early love interest in Los Angeles, Margaret Runyon, who was among Neville's most dedicated students. A cousin of American storyteller Damon Runyon, Margaret wooed the stocky Latin art student at a friend's house, slipping Carlos a slender Neville volume called The Search, in which she had inscribed her name and phone number. <laughs> the two became lovers and later husband and wife. Runyon frequently spoke to Castaneda about her mystical teacher Neville, but he responded with little more than mild interest, with one exception. In her memoirs, Runyon recalled Castaneda growing fascinated when the conversation turned to Neville's discipleship under an exotic teacher. She wrote, It was more than the message that attracted Carlos. It was Neville himself. He was so mysterious. Nobody was really sure who he was or where he had come from. There were vague references to Barbados in the West Indies and his being the son of an ultra-rich plantation family, but nobody knew for sure. They couldn't even be sure about this Abdullah business, his Indian teacher, who was always way back there in the jungle or someplace. The only thing you really knew about Neville was that he was here and that he might be back next week. But then again, there was, she concluded, a certain power in that position, an appealing kind of freedom in the lack of a past. And Carlos knew it. Both Neville and Castaneda were dealing with the same basic idea, and one that had a certain pedigree in America's alternative spiritual culture, tutelage under hidden spiritual masters. So Neville again and again told this story that there was this turbaned black man of Jewish descent <laughs> who tutored him starting in the year 1931 in Kabbalah, scripture, number symbolism, and mental metaphysics. He would describe Abdullah as this somewhat taciturn, mysterious figure who he met one day at a metaphysical lecture in 1931. And he walked in, and Abdullah said to him, No! You're six months late. <laughs> and I said, I had never seen this man before. And he said to him, The brothers told me you were coming, and you're six months late. And he said they spent the next five years together studying, and Neville had his first true awakening experience in 1933, in the winter, he was dying to get out of the Manhattan winter. He wanted to spend Christmas back home with his family in Barbados. He had no money. And Abdullah said to him, Walk the streets of Manhattan as if you are there, and you shall be. And so Neville said he would walk the gray, wintry streets of the Upper West Side, adopting the feeling that he was in the palm tree lined lanes of Barbados. And he would go to see. Abdullah tell him it wasn't working, I feel like an idiot, and Abdullah would slam the door in his face and say, You're not here, you're in Barbados. <laughs> and then one day before the last ship sailed from Barbados, his brother Victor, clearly from out of the clear blue, without any physical intercession on Neville's part, sends him a first class ticket to travel and fifty dollars. Come spend winter with us in Barbados. He said he was transformed by the experience. He felt that it was Abdullah's law of mental assumption that had come to his rescue. Now, this idea of hidden spiritual masters entered uh, Western culture through the influence of my beloved Madame Blavatsky and her partner, Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, who founded the movement of Theosophy here in New York City in 1975. They claimed to be under the tutelage of hidden spiritual masters, primarily these two beings, this one over here, Master Kutumi, who was said to be Tibetan. And next to him, Master Moria, who was said to be Indian. And they would send these sometimes ethereally produced letters to Blavatsky and Olcott, telling them what to do, giving them directions, giving them advice, giving them succor. And Colonel Olcott and Blavatsky were living at this building, which is still standing at the corner 
of 8th Avenue and West 47th Street, which was known as the Lamasery. Their headquarters or salon on the second floor of this building. Um, this was Colonel Olcott's room over here. This was, we visited this building on the occult New York walking tour. It's still standing. It doesn't look much different, although today it is an Econo Lodge. <laughs> and, uh, I've been in the lobby and none of the people who work there are very entranced with uh, my attempts to explain the history of their building to them. But we're trying. Uh, this was their salon. This was Madame Blavatsky's bedroom. Colonel Olcott said that once, one time in the winter, of uh, 1877, Master Moriam materialized in the room before him and directed him and Madame Blavatsky to relocate to the nation of India, which they did the following year. They helped instigate the Indian independence movement. Uh, Olcott went on speaking tours all over uh, the Near East, Far East, Japan, Sri Lanka. Helped instigate a rebirth of Buddhism throughout the East. They were enormously effective in their way, and Colonel Olcott attributed all of it to the presence of these mysterious spiritual masters, these great turbaned figures somewhere from the East who had given them instruction. Now, I first wrote about Neville in an article that was published in February of 2005 called Searching for Neville God. And that was an article that I published in a positive thinking magazine called Science of Mind. Things had been fairly quiet about Neville for many, many years, and that article attracted a lot of interest. And I started receiving phone calls and email after email after email asking me, who was Abdullah? Did he exist? Could he be identified? And I would tell people at the time that I thought it was just a kind of a mythos that Neville might have borrowed, flipped and pasted from theosophy. I didn't think there was any evidence to show that Abdullah was a real person, and I thought the dramatic claims around him were probably Neville's own myth-making. Now, to my surprise, I discovered that another figure in the positive thinking movement, a man named Joseph Murphy, who died in 1981, who wrote a very popular book, which some of you may have read, called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. He gave interviews in French to a priest who was writing a book about Murphy for a Quebec press. To this point, it's only been published in French in Quebec. It's called basically Dialogues with Joseph Murphy. And in it, Murphy offhandedly says, oh yes, I too was a student of Abdullah. We had the same teacher, Neville and I. Murphy actually came to New York just a few years before Neville. He was from Ireland. Murphy worked as a uh, pharmacist at the Algonquin Hotel. They used to have a little pharmacy in their lobby. And he became a metaphysical lecturer himself, was acquainted with Neville for several years, and in these interviews, which have never been translated into English, he says very simply and very matter-of-factly that Abdullah was his teacher too, and was a very real man. And I began to look around, and I began to correspond with people, and I came to feel, over the past few years, uh, that I happened upon a figure who might actually be Abdullah. And he was this man, Arnold Josiah Ford. He was a mystic, black nationalist, and part of a movement called the Black Hebrew Movement, which still exists and exists in various forms. <coughs> he was born in Barbados, Neville's home island, in 1877. He emigrated to Harlem in 1910. He became involved with Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, of which he was musical director. This is one of the very few surviving photographs of Arnold Josiah Ford. Can you see him over here? This is outside of a storefront synagogue that he ran. He, in addition to being a very, very devoted follower of Marcus Garvey, who had his own mind power metaphysics, about which I'll say a quick word in a moment. Ford was part of a movement called Ethiopianism. It was a precursor to Rastafarianism. Ford believed, as the Rastafarian people do, and as many other people do with good reason, that Ethiopia, one of the oldest continuous civilizations on Earth, one of the most populous nations on Earth, one of the most populous nations in Africa, was home to a lost 
tribe of Israel that had its own blend of what we know as traditional historical Judaism and and its own mystical teachings and mental metaphysics. And the movement of Ethiopianism believed that this lost African Israelite tribe harbored a great wealth of ancient teachings that had been lost on most modern people. The Ethiopianism, the Ethiopianism movement had its own form of mind power metaphysics and mental healing. Ford was a rabbi who had his own African American congregation in Harlem. He considered himself a man of authentic Israelite and Jewish descent. He was described in 1946 by the occult philosopher Israel Regardi, who had been a secretary to the occultist Alistair Crowley, as an eccentric Ethiopian rabbi. He was living in Harlem in 1931. This is according to census records that I have. He identified his occupation to the census taker as rabbi. That was the same year that Neville met Abdullah. Neville may have been playing around with the name a little bit. He would affectionately refer to Abdullah in his lectures as Ab. Ab is a variant of the Hebrew word Abba, for father. He saw Abdullah, Ford, as a kind of a father figure. He said they studied metaphysics, scripture, Kabbalah together for five years. Ford has been written about in histories of the black Hebrew movement as perhaps the key figure who brought authentic knowledge of the Hebrew language, Talmud, and Kabbalah into the black Hebrew movement as it existed in Harlem at that time. So he was a person of some learning. He was also, as I said, a follower of Marcus Garvey. Something that I write about in Occult America and that I read about in the new book is Garvey has not been properly understood in our culture. He was a pioneering black nationalist figure. He was a great pioneering activist and voice of liberation. He was also very much into his own brand of mental metaphysics. You might recognize this statement from Bob Marley's lyrics in a song called Redemption Song. We are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. Garvey's speeches are shot through with new thought language, with the language of mental metaphysics. Shot through. This was an essential part of Garvey's culture. It was an essential part of the culture of Ethiopianism, which saw Ethiopia's crowned emperor, Haile Selassie, who was coronated in 1930, as a messianic figure. This movement of Ethiopianism became Rastafarianism. It started in the mid-1930s. Now, there are a lot of correspondences between Arnold Josiah Ford and Neville's description of Abdullah, including physical correspondences, turban and such. The timeline does not match up sufficiently to make it conclusively, because Ford left America sometime in 1931, and he moved to the Ethiopian countryside. After Haile Selassie was coronated as emperor, he offered a land grant to any African American willing to emigrate to Ethiopia. He saw Ethiopia in a way that very, matched, very much matched uh, Ford's ideals as a kind of African Israel. And he wanted Afro-Caribbean and Afro-American black people to 
move or to come home, as he saw it, to Ethiopia. So he offered land grants. So Ford and about 30 followers of Ethiopianism here in New York accepted the land grants. There's been some debate about when Ford left, but I have a New York Times article that places Ford here in New York City still in December of 1930. He didn't leave until 1931. That was the same year that Neville said he met him. So the timeline doesn't match up because Neville said they studied together for five years. So it's possible that Ford was one of several teachers that Neville had, and he created a kind of composite figure who he called Abdullah, Ab, father, of whom Ford may have been a part. Now, in a coda to Ford's life, I tell you, it was a tougher and braver and more brutal existence back then in some regards. Ford, who for 20 years has been living as a musician and a rabbi in Harlem, moves to rural Ethiopia, the northern part of this nation, to accept Haile Selassie's land grant. He dies there in 1935. Tragically, there are no records of Ford's life in Ethiopia. It must have been very difficult. Imagine being a metropolitan person and uprooting yourself to a completely rural setting in a developing nation in the 1930s, and Mussolini is beating the war drum and Mussolini's fascist troops invade Ethiopia just weeks after Ford's death. They cross the North border. This was a man who put himself through tremendous ordeals for his principles. I can't conclude that Ford was Abdullah. But Murphy's testimony suggests that there was an Abdullah, and I think Ford corresponds in so many ways, and I write about this in the new book, that there probably is some intersection there. There's another figure I want to mention of a very different kind whose thought had some indirect intersection with Neville's, and that is our friend Aleister Crowley, the British occultist. This is the most cheerful picture I could possibly find of Crowley, so he's almost smiling. Um, Crowley makes a very interesting statement uh, in a, a book that he received in a way that we might call channeled perception in 1904 that was later published broadly in 1938 called The Book of the Law. And in this book, Crowley records, each of us has thus an universe of his own, but it is the same universe for each one as soon as it includes all possible experience. This implies the extension of consciousness to include all other consciousnesses. In our present state, the object that you see is never the same as the one that I see. We infer that it is the same because your experience tallies with mine on so many points that the actual differences of our observation are negligible. Yet all the time, neither of us can know anything at all beyond the total impression made on our respective minds. Neville said something similar. Do you realize that no two people live in the same world? We may be together now in this room, but we will go home tonight and close our doors on entirely different worlds. Tomorrow, we will go to work where we will meet others, but each one of us live in our own mental and physical world. Neville meant this in the most literal sense. He believed that every individual within the form of his or her own imagination was God. And that everyone you see, including me standing in this room, is rooted in you as you are ultimately rooted in God, and that we exist in this world of infinite possibilities and realities, and that, in fact, when we mentally picture something, we're not creating it. It already exists. We're claiming it. The very fact of being able to experience it mentally confirms that in this world of infinite possibilities, where imagination is the ultimate creative agent, everything that you can picture already is. Some of the things that Neville said prefigured studies both in psychical research and in quantum physics, and I want to say a quick word about that. This man seated here with these two test subjects is one of my heroes, J.B. Rhine, who was a psychical researcher who did tens of thousands of trials at Duke University in the 1930s and beyond to test for clairvoyant perception. He would use this deck of cards called Zener cards, where if you were guessing 
you had a 1 in 5 chance, 20% chance, of naming the right car. As Ryan documented, in literally tens of thousands of painstaking trials, with meticulous clinical control, there were certain individuals who persistently, under controlled conditions, scored higher than a chance hit of 20%. It wasn't always dramatically higher. It wasn't like Zeus was aiming lightning bolts at the Earth. But if someone, over the course of thousands of trials, keeps scoring 25%, 26%, 27%, beyond all chance possibility, and the results are parsed, jury, gone over, reviewed, you have some anomalous transfer of information going on in a laboratory setting. Ryan's research was real. And Ryan noticed, and he had this very quietly monumental way of describing things, he would make some observation in a footnote that could be extraordinary. He noticed that the correlation to a high success rate of hits on the Zener cause was usually a feeling of enthusiasm, positive expectation, hopefulness, belief in the possibility of ESP, an encouraging environment, and that when boredom or physical exhaustion would set in or interest would wane, results would go down. If interests were somehow renewed, revived, there was a feeling of comity in the testing room, results would go up. We haven't even begun to deal with the implications of Ryan's experiments. There was another parapsychologist, Charles Onerton, who began a series of experiments in the 1970s, I see him as Ryan's successor, called the Gansfeld Experiments. Gansfeld is German for whole field. Again, we were talking about the hypnagogic state, the state of drowsiness. Onerton and his collaborators theorized that if you could induce the near sleep state in an individual, put somebody in conditions of comfortable isolation, give them eye coverings, uh, give them white noise or some kind of negative sound to listen to, put them in a greatly relaxed state, it might be possible to heighten the appearance of some kind of clairvoyant faculty. And his test was to place one person in a comfortable isolation tank, as you see here, to place another person, a sender, in another room, to have the sender try to mentally send an image, a flower, a rocket, a boat, something, to the receiver and see what happens. They would use four images. Three were decoys, one was real. Again, in certain subjects, and also in the subjects as a whole, in the form of a meta-analysis, Honerton found over and over again results that showed a higher than 25% chance hit when people were placed into this hypnagogic state. Again, we're in this state all the time. When you're napping, when you're dozing off at your desk, when you're going to sleep, when you're waking up. Neville's message? Use it. Honerton died very young. In 1992, at age 46, he had suffered health problems his whole life. If he had lived if he had lived, his name would be as well known as J.B. Ryan. He was a great parapsychologist. Um, there's another field that's burgeoning today called neuroplasticity. In short, brain imaging shows that repeat thoughts change the pathways through which electrical impulses travel in our brains. This has been used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there's a uh, research psychologist, Jeffrey Schwartz, at UCLA, who has come up with a program to displace obsessive thoughts by encouraging patients and people in his clinical trials that the moment they experience an obsessive thought to substitute something else in for it, a pleasurable physical activity, listening to music, jogging, whatever you want, just anything that gets you off that obsessive thought. And he has found through brain imaging, and many scientists have replicated this data, that if you repeat an exercise like that, eventually biologic changes manifest in the brain, neural pathways change, thoughts themselves seem to alter brain biology as far as electrical impulses are, are concerned. Uh, there was a new thought writer in 1911 who without any of the contemporary brain imaging and neuroscience came up with exactly 
the same prescription. His name was John Henry Randall. He called it substitution. His language and the language used today by 21st century researchers in neuroplasticity is extraordinarily similar. Finally, you have in the field of quantum physics an extraordinary set of questions that have been emerging actually for 80 years about the extent to which observation influences the manifestation of subatomic particles. I just want to give a very brief example. Basically, what quantum physics experiments have shown is that if you direct a wave of particles at a box, at a slit, or two boxes, two slits, that wave, often in the form of a wave of light, will collapse into a kind of particle state, go from a wave to a particle state when a conscious observation or measurement is taking place. So that what happens in the absence of an observer, if you direct a wave of light at, say, two boxes, there are interference patterns that can show that the particle-like properties of that wave of light at one time appear to both boxes. And only when someone makes the determination to look do those particles become localized in one box. In 1935, the physicist Erwin Schrodinger felt that the conclusions of these quantum experiments were so outrageous, were so contrary to all observed experience, that he engaged in a thought experiment called Schrodinger's Cat, which you've probably heard of. He did not intend his thought experiment to endorse quantum theorizing. He intended it to force quantum theorists to deal with the ultimate and what he saw as absurdist conclusions of their theories. Theories which have never been overturned. Theories which have been affirmed for 80 years. Now, Schrodinger's cat in brief comes down to this. You can put it this way. You take two boxes. You put a cat into one of the two boxes. You fire a subatomic particle at the boxes. One box is empty. One box has the cat. Inside the box with the cat is what he called a diabolical device. The diabolical device trips a beaker of poison when it's collided with by the subatomic particle, thus killing the cat. So, you do your experiment, Go to check the boxes. Which box is the particle in? Is the cat dead? Is the cat alive? The cat is both, Schrodinger insisted. It has to be both, because subatomic particles can be shown to exist in more than one place until someone checks. Oh, but no, no, no. That makes no sense. All lived experience tells us you got two boxes, you got one cat. The cat's dead if you fired it into the box with the cat, or the cat's alive if you fired it into the box. The Schrodinger said no, because interference experiments can show that at one point the subatomic particle was in a wave state. It was only in a potential state. It existed in both boxes. It's only when you went to check and opened up one of the boxes that it became localized. It was in both boxes at one time before a conscious observer made the decision to check. The later group of physicists said, there's no avoiding Schrodinger's conclusion, and in fact, if you were to check eight hours later, you would not only find a cat that was living and a cat that was dead, but you would find a cat that was hungry because it hadn't been fed for eight hours. And they were completely serious. Schrodinger didn't intend for this thought experiment to affirm this radical departure from reality. He intended it to show up what he considered to be the absurdist conclusions of quantum physics. The trouble is, the quantum physics data kept mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting, and Schrodinger's thought experiment became, to some physicists, a symbol 
of the extraordinary physical impossibilities that we were seeing in the world of quantum physics. What was being suggested was that we live in a serial universe, that there are multiple realities, whether we can experience them or not, because subatomic particles behave in this completely extraordinary and seemingly impossible way, parallel events are occurring. Why don't we experience this? The world we live in is controlled by Newtonian mechanics. There aren't dead alive cats. Why don't we experience this? Today, there's a theory that makes the rounds among quantum physicists that when something gets bigger and bigger, because remember, these experiments are done on subatomic particles. These are the smallest isolated fragments of matter. But there is a theory that is circulating among quantum physicists today that when we pull back from a microscopic view of things, we experience what is known as information leakage the world gets less and less clear as it gets bigger and bigger. As we exit the subatomic level and enter the mechanical level that we know and feel where we have solid floorboards beneath our feet, where there's one of me, we lose information. Uh, the American philosopher William James made the same observation in 1902. He said, when you look at an object under a microscope, you're getting so much information, and more and more and more and more is lost as you pan back he said, this is true of all human experience. There's a cohort of quantum physicists that are saying the same thing. And in fact, this stuff is going on all the time, and we don't know it. Because we lose information in this coarse physical world that we live in. Neville said something similar. You radiate the world around you by the intensity of your imagination and feelings. A quantum physicist might say, observation. I just unplugged this. Or did I? It's plugged in and unplugged. <laughs> you radiate the world around you by the intensity of your imagination and feelings. But in this three-dimensional world, time beats so slowly that you do not always observe the relationship between the visible world and your inner nature. You and I can contemplate a desire and become it. And because of the slowness of time, it is easy to forget what we formerly set out to worship or destroy. So, quantum physicists speak of information leakage. Neville spoke of time leakage. Time moves so slowly in our world that we lose a sense of cause and effect. Scientists will one day explain why there is a serial universe, but in practice, how you use this serial universe to change the future is more important. So, I want to leave us tonight with a slogan of an American occultist, P.B. Randolph, who lived here in New York City. He was a man of African-American descent and a tremendous original thinker and mystical experimenter. He died young in 1875. This was his personal slogan. Try. Try. This slogan later appeared in letters from these spiritual masters, Kutumi and Mora, Moria, that started uh, reaching the attention of Colonel Henry Steele Olcott in the 1870s. They used the same slogan, try. This is something to try. Neville's challenge was ultimate and it was simple. Put my ideas to the test, prove them to yourself, or dismiss them. But what a tragedy would be not to try. It's all so simple. I want to conclude with words from William Blake, who was one of Neville's key inspirations. Blake would talk about the coarse world that we lived in. He would describe these things sometimes in matters of geography. When he would say England, he didn't mean England the nation exactly. He meant the coarse world in which men and women find themselves. The world in which we see so little and the parameters close in so tightly that we don't know what's really going on. And then he would talk about Jerusalem, which he saw as a world, as a reality, that was created through the divine imagination 
of the Creator as it coursed through sensitive men and women. And I want to close with some lines from William Blake, and I hope you'll try to hear them as Neville heard them himself. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon these clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here amongst these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. O clouds, unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Now, I know it's late, and uh, you've been very patient with me. <laughs> if there are a few questions, you know, I'd be happy to take them. Oh, what a wonderful question. You know, Neville's own students in his lifetime asked him asked that very, very thing. And I'm in the same place myself, you know, because it's hard sometimes to limit one's wishes to one thing. He said that he felt it was more effective if you limited it to one thing. But he said that was by no means uh, a limit. You didn't have to. Uh, the, the key thing is that you feel the desire intensely, that you... Uh, set this mental emotive picture with clarity and simplicity and that you stick to your idea and repeat it. He did say he felt that the time interval would be less uh, if you limited it to one thing and he said that tended to be his practice but he did not by any means view that as a must. And then my second question is that it has to do with the simplicity aspect. I have something that is a bit complex so to try to achieve the simplicity do I meditate on it? How, how do I get from his idea was that you would think about what event would transpire if that thing that you wished for came to pass. And there may be many events that would transpire if it came to pass, but he would say, select just one that has a particular emotional resonance so that you see yourself doing it over and over as simple as a handshake or as simple as climbing a rung on a ladder. Just take one that has emotional gravity for you. in the palm tree line lanes of Barbados, but he most often came back to this idea of physical immobility and the hypnagogic state, the drowsy state. And he again and again and again said that others can experiment and should experiment, but that he personally found that to be the simplest and the most effective. He would say sometimes he would enter the, the, the hypnagogic state and just feel 
thankful or try to seize upon one expression like it is wonderful and try to feel that if he didn't have a specific thing that he was longing for at that moment. Um, so he did experiment with, with some other uh, techniques and points of view. He, he did say that it was, it was, there was one lecturer he was saying to people, you praise others and you will shine. He felt it was very important to try to use these techniques to the benefit of another person. Like for example, if you had a friend who was looking for a job, you might form the mental picture of congratulating him or her and finding a perfect job. Because his idea was that, I mean, he believed in the oneness of humanity in the absolute most literal sense. There was no sentimentality about it. He felt that every individual was God. Did he explicitly say at all that he believed that the universe was holographic? He would say, and, and again, you know, he sometimes made these statements more in passing than he would full on go into them, but he would say very explicitly that we live in a universe of infinite possibilities, and everything that you desire, by the very fact of having desired it, because your imagination is a creative agent, already exists. It was a question of just claiming it, which is why it was so important to think from the desire fulfilled. Think from the desire fulfilled. It doesn't matter if you open your eyes or your checkbook or anything else, and of course reality, as we know it presently, comes rushing in, you must think from the wish fulfilled. And he said that was tantamount to selecting a reality that already existed. Schrodinger said there's a dead alive cat. Mel would have said there are infinite outcomes and they all exist. Uh, the quote in regards to the slowness of time made me curious what his thoughts were as far as the timetables for his technique. Yes. Yes. He said that we experience definite time intervals and that a time interval is part of the nature of our existence and I may want a new house and I may want that house right now and I may think from the end of having that house. But he said, look, the fact of the world that we experience here and now is that the trees have to grow to produce wood, the wood has to be harvested, the carpenter has to cut it. There will be time intervals. And he would say to people, you know, your time interval could be an hour, it could be a month, it could be weeks, it could be years. There is a time interval. And he would say that. He would say, though, that you have to stick to the ideal. Stick to the ideal. And try to make it just exquisitely effortless. He didn't endorse using the will. You know, this wasn't about sort of saying, I'm going to think this way. It was going into this meditative or drowsy or hypnagogic state, picturing something that confirmed uh, the coming to pass of your desire, feeling it emotionally. And he said, you know, when the method fails, maybe because you're trying too hard. He wanted people to understand that there was an exquisite ease that one should feel in using these exercises. Well, it sounds like he's describing a development of receptivity at the same time as desire yes. for something. Yes. And, the, and that lack of emphasis on pure will um, would basically upset that balance. Yes. He, he, he used the word receptivity and he used the term time interval. And he did say there were intervals to everything. Yes? Did Merrill at all talk about, uh, for example, in the history of others, the idea of um, constitutional space? Um, did he uh, ever include that as part of he made very few yeah. He made very few references to other thought systems. He would very, very frequently quote from scripture, mostly the New Testament. He felt the New Testament was a great blueprint and metaphor for human development in the figure of Christ. Uh, he felt that the Old Testament was sort of suggestive of the promise, the New Testament was fulfilling of the promise. And beyond that, he made very, very, very little reference to other thought systems. He was chiefly interested in scripture. He would talk about numbers and symbolism. In his first book, which was called Your Faith is Your Fortune, he would talk about certain aspects of the zodiac and astrology and number symbolism. But as time passed, he made fewer and fewer references to other systems. Every now and again, I can tease out a piece of language where I'll say, ah, that's a male kue. You know, that was an influence. But so much of what he talked about really came from his own description of the world and his own experience, he made very little reference to other systems. Okay. Okay, this was a little kind of like, in a way, well, uh, before you uh, began your talk, uh, 
find you a little early and I started reading your book of Cult America. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a question in my mind. In, a, in what I've uh, looked at so far in Occult America, mm -hmm. uh, you write that a lot of uh, uh, positive thinkers and new thought people and new age people in American history have, on the one hand, that kind of uh, advocated uh, basically techniques and methods and uh, goals of uh, selfish uh, success and uh, money and wealth pursuit. While on the other hand, a lot of uh, the better and greater uh, new age and positive thinking and uh, new thought thinkers mm -hmm. have also been very passionately involved in progressive social yes. reform movements. How did in terms of this uh, dichotomy, how did Neville stand? What was, where, where did he bring this aspect? That's a wonderful question. And uh, that was an aspect for me that made it difficult at first to enter Neville's work because he had no social concerns whatsoever. And if people raised social concerns, he would push them aside and he would insist that the world you see, whether one of beauty or violence, is self-created. So prove the theory to yourself and then use the theory as you wish. If you want to eliminate suffering, eliminate suffering. But he ardently rejected any uh, fealty to any kind of social movement or ideal. He believed that uh, coming into one's awareness of the godlike nature of the imagination, of the literal god presence of the imagination, and being having the experience of being reborn through one's skull, and yet, was an essential human task. Yeah, and yet there are a lot of, like, you know, like the, uh, as you mentioned in your own book, a lot of the 19th century uh, spiritualist progressives were very much involved in things like abolition. Yes. And well, you know, these radical movements, radical political movements and radical spiritual movements, avant-garde politics, avant-garde spirituality, they all intersected. So that we, we failed to understand how a figure like Marcus Garvey, for example, was involved with mental metaphysics, but as you get closer and closer to the real life of these people, it becomes more and more natural because they were, they craved a new social order, spiritually and politically. I think that's a good place. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.